done this, but I'll jump in <laughs> to, to get us started. Um, and I don't know if there's a specific order that Chris, Chris usually goes in, but I'm just going to go down the chat. Uh, so Dan, you're the first one on my chat. Dan Bryant, Square One Villages. I'm eating lunch, so I've got my video off. Fair enough. Bree Vincent. Hi, everyone. Bree Vincent, uh, Project Coordinator with Connected Lane County. Cindy Perry. Hi there. I'm Cindy Perry, Director of Workforce Investments with the Lane Workforce Partnership. Uh, Deanna? Hi, Deanna Strawn Wilson, Lane County Health and Human Services, Workforce Services. And I'm eating lunch too. Excellent. Cole. Uh, Cole Hayslip, City of Anita, Management Analyst. Excellent. If anybody has any quick updates, usually I think this is where you're able to give that as well. Um, see and i i'm gonna have a difficulty knowing which one's county staff which ones aren't so if i call on you and, and your county staff that's fair too but diana says lane county so i assume it's staffer yes. oh it's our you may be talking about dana dana oh okay i there's diana's on here so i always <laughs> um enough. dana davidson lane county uh quality compliance data analyst excellent Danielle. Hi, Danielle Bautista. I work for Lane County Human Services Division. And just an announcement, just want folks to know too that um, December 21st next week is the um, National Homeless Persons Memorial Day. And it looks like there will be a vigil from seven to eight at the East Park Blocks in Eugene. Thank you. David. Dave Haverland, United States Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm the Employment Committee Chair and serve on the Membership Committee. Excellent, thank you. Donna. I provide um, services for students and families who experience homelessness for Bethel School District, otherwise known as McKinney Vento Liaison. Wonderful, thank you. Gina. I'm Gina Miho, I'm the Administrator here over at Clearview RTH in Springfield. Wonderful. Hillary. Lane County staff, anti poverty programs. James. Hi, I'm Lane County staff. I'm uh, the outreach and coordinated entry supervisor. Wonderful. Jason. Jason Nedrick, City of Eugene staff. Julie. Julie, uh, oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Julie Lambert, and I'm with the Lived Experience Advisory Group for Unhoused Engagement. Okay, Julie with Hope and Safety Alliance. She Julie with Hope and Safety Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> and happy holidays, everybody. Kate. Hi, I'm Kate Bud. I'm the new housing manager with uh, Lane County. Catherine. Hi, sorry. Catherine Ryan uh, with the Civic Source Lane CCO. Catherine Hunt. Uh, I'm just an interested citizen. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. Lori Trigger. Good afternoon, Lori Trigger, Lane County Commissioner, District 3. Sean. Uh, Sean Murphy with Laurel Hill Center, and I represent um, Behavioral Health Services. Great. Uh, Lise. Hi, Lisa Stewart, Human Services Division Analyst. This is uh, uh, Mayor Venice. Lucy Venice, Mayor of Eugene. Malia. I'm Malia Meyer, she her pronouns, and I'm from Looking Glass. Maria Cortez. Maria, Maria Cortez, uh, Shelter Program Service Coordinator with Lane County. Great. Uh, Matias. Matias Smith, Youth Representative. Great. 
Michelle. Michelle Hankus, shelter care. Uh, Mike. Mike Fleck, Cottage Grove City Councilor, applicant for the rural elected uh, position and uh, director of community sharing. Thank you. I'll bounce around again. RS? RS Salp? Yes, sorry, I had to meet, unmute myself. Uh, Richard Self, actually, with the League and the Shelter Stakeholders Committee, as well as the Human Rights Commission and KVW Radio. Thanks, Richard. Sarai. Hi, it's Sarai Johnson, Joint Shelter and Housing Strategist, City of Eugene and Lane County. Mayor Van Gordon. Uh, Sean Van Gordon, Mayor of Springfield. Sheila. Sheila Wagner, District Manager for Oregon Department of Human Services with oversight over the self-sufficiency and child welfare programs. And I think one of our big updates, if you haven't heard, is our Director for Child Welfare has been nominated by the Biden-Harris administration to be the Commissioner for the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. So that's really impressive and will, I think, impact Oregon in really positive ways. So hopefully this has to go through a confirmation, but I believe he will make it. That's fantastic. Shelly. It's Shelly Galvin, poverty, or sorry, philanthropy chair, and I am the chief people officer at CBT Nuggets. Thanks, Shelly. Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl Balthrop from the Eugene Mission. A couple of updates. We are in full swing, getting ready for inclement weather, and also for our Christmas Eve and Christmas Day meals, which we're expanding to the broader community and outreach. And hopefully those two things or three things will not coincide. Wonderful, thank you. Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Talbot, Lane County staff, and I am the supervisor for the rent and energy programs. Wonderful, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve Manella. I'm the Human Services Manager at Lane County. Susan. Hello, I'm Susan Lopez, she, her pronouns. And I am the Victim Services Representative on Poverty and Homelessness Board and chair of the Youth Homeless Solutions Work Group. Wonderful, Todd. Uh, Todd Schneider, Community Supported Shelters. Thanks Todd and uh, William. Dr. Willie Foster, I'm chair of the health uh, committee employed by Peace Health as an ER doctor involved with Black Thistle, Occupy Medical, Volunteers in Medicine, and um, other outreaches to the homeless um, medically. Thank you. I think I saw Debbie Farr jump on. Yeah, thanks, Brittany. Hi, everybody. Debbie Farr, Community Relations Manager for Trillium Community Health Plan. Uh, Commissioner Farr. Hi, I'm Pat Farr, a Board of County Commissioners. I'm a voting member of the uh, Property and Homeless Board. And I think I saw Brooke jump on as well. Perhaps. By the way, hi, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> hi, everyone. Sorry about that. I was having, having trouble unmuting. Brooke Freed, City of Eugene, City Manager's Office. Excellent. So... I do feel like maybe I missed some other people who jumped on while I was going down the alphabetical list here. Is anybody, do we miss anyone? Excellent. I'm Brittany Quick Corner, Eugene Chamber of Commerce, uh, business representative and uh, co-chair for the homelessness side of the new split that we made last month. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, Diana, if you've heard from Chris, I haven't heard anything. So thought maybe we'd give him a little bit of time to jump on with this. Yeah, I haven't heard from him at all. Um, okay. I suppose we can pop back up the agenda and just kick into the next piece if it's possible. Are you able to pop the agenda back up?
Can you see it now? Nope. Oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. So I, I've got the meeting on one on the screen and the, my minutes, and then I've got the, the shared screen on the other. So I'm hopping around a lot. <laughs> the joys of Zoom technology here. That's okay. Um, let's see here. If you are okay with it, I'm going to pass over number two and leave that for Chris when hopefully he's able to make it. Um, and perhaps we let Kate give a little introduction. Sure. Glad to. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Kate Budd. I'm the new housing manager with the housing division. Uh, I am new to Lane County. I had previously worked in Clark County, Washington, uh, where I've lived for the last 16 years. Uh, during that time period, I worked for the county uh, for about seven years as a program coordinator, overseeing a number of our homelessness uh, funds, as well as our community action funds, focusing on anti-poverty programs. From that role, I moved to a nonprofit agency in the community uh, where I served as the executive director for the last five years. Uh, the agency was unique in that it had actually been created by the city, the county, and the housing authority to address the challenges that they saw even in the 80s around homelessness in the community. So uh, I was interested in transitioning down to Lane County because my sister uh, is a professor here at U of O. Uh, she and her partner have a three-year-old. Uh, and because of COVID, it just helped us um, you know, realize that being their family and being together was really important. And so uh, when this position opened up, I was excited because I think it was a great translation of uh, my experience professionally, as well as my, my passion personally, especially as someone with lived homelessness experience, uh, to be able to put that uh, to work uh, here in a new community. So glad to be here, glad to continuing um, we meet all of you and have the opportunity to learn about the great work that you've been doing and also where you are looking to move uh, as we continue to address this challenge. So uh, again, um, know that I'll likely reach out to you in the next few months uh, for a chance to, to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and until then, look forward to bumping into you in meetings. Thanks. Wonderful. We, well, I was glad to have the opportunity to chat with you a couple of days ago and excited about some of the experience you have working with Built for Zero and some of the things you were able to accomplish in your previous community. So we're lucky that you you came down here. <laughs> All right, so still not seeing anything from Chris. Um, the action that we need to follow up on from the previous meeting is accepting, or excuse me, approving the minutes um, from the October meeting and then accepting the November 2021 financials. So is there a motion to approve the minutes from October 2021? Brittany, this is Debbie Farr. I will make uh, the motion to approve the minutes. Thanks, Debbie. We had a second. Julie Wiesman, I'll second. Great. Debbie moved and Julie seconded. All those in favor, please say aye or wave your hand at your camera. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. All right. And now our financials for November 2021. You'll have to uh, forgive me if, and hopefully a staff can jump in and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. Is there any necessary presentation for those financials before we can make a motion? Um, it's uh, it's uh, not necessary to make a presentation. Uh, the motion would be to accept the financials. The one thing that I'd like to mention is that we have been processing enormous amounts of rent assistance and um, we just billed the state last Friday about uh, close to $13 million. So um, when this was processed, I think that our fund account was in the hole significantly, but that's just uh, a, a more of a cash flow 
issue and as being part of the county um that's it's not an issue for a fund of the, the county uh to be momentarily uh in deficit thanks steve we'll get a motion on the floor and then ask for any other discussion after that can i get a motion to approve the november financials i'll go ahead and move to approve the financials thanks shelly galvin moved is there a second? I'll, I'll second it, Lucy Thank Venice. You. Mayor Venice second. Uh, I wanna, any, any discussion? I, I actually would love to speak to it for a minute. Um, I, you know, I uh, actually appreciate Steve just giving us a little framing on these financials. I do think that this is one of our required roles on this board is to approve the financials and we, we we don't really pay any attention to them, to be honest. And I, I do think that if this is one of our really sort of legal obligations, that there should be at least a little orientation of this board to what's in these financials and what might be noteworthy. I mean, I think we should be a, just a little, have a little more understanding of what this says. It's a big document and we tend to just to kind of rubber stamp it every, and it's not that I don't trust, but it's our legal, legal obligation to approve it. So I would just suggest that we actually should have a brief presentation on these financials in the future. Thanks, Mayor Vanessa. You kind of took the words out of my mouth. I could not agree more. I have a question. Um, uh, Steve, when you uh, mentioned that the billing was out there that you billed the state, it, does that show up as an accounts receivable anywhere on this financial statement? It does, it does not, uh, because this, um, this statement was uh, for the end of the previous month of November, and we're in the month of December currently. And so did you bill the state in the month of December? That's why it's not showing as accounts receivable in November? Yes. Okay, so next month's financials, when we look at it, would show that $14 million accounts receivable? uh that 12 and a half million sorry yes yeah. okay thank you excellent thanks any other questions pat co-chair co quentin warner not a question but uh, chris McAllister is in the room with us the, the chair of the uh, the however he's locked on mute at the point at this point in time so chris mm -hmm. you're hearing me if you want me to say anything just text me i'll i'll be your voice in the meantime co-chair quick warner you have the gavel Oh, okay. Well, well great. Chair. Glad you made it, Chris. And as soon as you're able to unmute, you're welcome to take over. Um, I don't know if that's a staff person who can try to unmute him. Um, any other questions or comments, discussion on the financials? Perhaps we can take to the um, executive committee meeting this next month, a uh, possible process uh, adjustment where we're able to do some sort of financial presentation each month and maybe even perhaps a financial orientation um, for the whole board, but then include that in an onboarding process if if that feels like a comfortable way to move about that. I perceive that I see Kate Budd making that note. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, can I make a suggestion too, is that that what might be helpful for everyone is just to have a, a, a summary document that Steve, that almost included what you just told us, that, you know, that we had billed <clears throat> it's outstanding, things like that. Just a summary of the variances, just so we can see. And we, I think many of us are experienced with financial documents. We understand that there's billings and every month, seeing a monthly statement doesn't always accurately reflect what's going on. Quarterlies are a little bit better. So maybe just a summary that just simply explains some of the larger variances that you anticipate getting questions about. Sure, I'm uh, sure we can put that together and do that. No problem. Yeah. And Steve, you know, I'd be happy to help contribute, uh, help the staff kind of brainstorm what an appropriate sort of way to present that to the public is. I think that's an important piece of this to Julie's point. Those of us here, a lot of us are working with our own budgets that we can help read those, but even the, the public have, being able to digest it might be important too. Yes, agreed. Great. Pat. Just a note for everybody, some folks may not be fully aware of this, but uh, um, 
the county has budgeted for broadcast of this meeting and the executive meeting every other month. So we are live on uh, on TV right now, and it will be rebroadcast. So there is a public audience that goes beyond the people who are actually signed up to watch live online. Awesome. Text my mom to tell her I'm on TV right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's if there's point. no other comments, I'll uh, go ahead and call the vote. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Cheryl's abstaining. Cheryl Walthrop. I'm saying to, I assume, a staff who's taking minutes. And thank you for that. Uh, okay. Thank you, guys. We, I think, have moved through the business. And I'm hoping, Chris, I don't know if you're having any more luck with your I have been unmuted. Thank Yay. you. Yay! Uh, All right, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got an assist from staff, so uh, thank you, everybody. Um, let's uh, move on to uh, committee reports, if I may. Um, Dave Heverlin, are you present? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I am present as the committee chair of the employment. Um, first of all, thanks for the county staff and the participation of the members of the committee. Um, most recently, we discussed surrounding increasing capacity of the homeless service providers um, around homelessness, jobs retention, and training. Those involved in providing those services um, expressed burnout, and we're, we're looking at what we can do to assist or help in that area. Um, we also focused on goals and training tactics for increasing employment opportunities for our homeless and poverty stricken citizens and anticipate this work carrying on into 2022 as additions to our work plan or refocus of our work plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, and uh, really appreciate the work that you and the committee are doing uh, as someone who's been able to attend uh, that one, particularly uh, over these uh, COVID days. Uh, uh, I really am glad that this one's uh, on the uh, on the docket, working on stuff. We're going to have to recover, and uh, this is going to be one of the ways to do it. Uh, next, uh, Julie Lambert, are you present for league update? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the lived experience advisory group for unhoused engagement, we have more than one iron in the fire, but I'd like to share our most potentially helpful project. It has been to design a strategy that could be in print and or digital form that is a very simple tool for navigation. There are some forms of this online already, such as 211, but the idea for this project is to simplify, just give a pointer to those resources. And to also give someone an A to B to Z idea of what direction they need to go in with the end goal of being housing or a better place i.e. we could just point them in the general direction. People need to know we even have a nav navigation center before they can find it. So the idea is just to simplify the process of getting help. Uh, we haven't yet discussed the exact form that this will take shape in, but there are a few ways we can get this information out. At this point in the creative process, we are utilizing a Jamboard to get a visual, for example, one of the ways this information could be conveyed is in the form of a flow chart, or it could be a printed list. Um, it would be nice to have something to fold and fit in a back pocket, or even do a trifold business card so it could easily be tucked in a wallet and carried everywhere. Um, this is not an original idea. It has worked in Ohio and other states. In Houston, they have both a full size folded street guide and a street card with up-to-date information about resources that are available. I know we have local nonprofits that follow a similar model tailored to their specialty with a card and printed info. There is no one way to do it and we expect the project to change and evolve as we go as does our state of homelessness to include a planned expiration date. Also, many of the goals are similar, similar to Sarai's recent outline for coordinated entry. Our project is intended to be a jump off point and a clear path is with an overview so we can meet people where they are and give them an idea of what they need to do and how as information is power. 
And in the end, we would all like to see everyone sheltered. And later, Chris will have more information. I'm sorry, Richard will have more information about how this can evolve during comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. That was excellent. Um, looking forward for that resource. Uh, Mr. Bryant, would you be willing to speak for the shelter committee? Yes, I will. So uh, this is the committee that uh, Pat Carr originally um, chaired for many years. It began as the group focused on unhoused veterans, if I recall correctly. Our members include the mayors of Eugene and Springfield uh, and staff members from the various jurisdictions. We have the heads of at least three of our uh, agencies plus staff members from several others. Um, I think I counted three people on the committee with lived experience. Um, at any rate, uh, a broadly based group that's primary purpose as I see it is to provide a forum for stakeholders to provide advice and counsel to PHB and to engage in active planning and support of the goals and purpose of PHB. Uh, we receive monthly updates from the various jurisdictions and members um, to try to keep each other informed of what we're all doing. And typically in each of our meetings, we focus on two or three topics at most, uh, providing implants, uh, input on the plans for things like the Navigation Center, the uh, Brooklyn Avenue emergency shelter that's now evolving, uh, looking at the strategies for the hazardous uh, weather shelter, even warming center, uh, the safe sleeping sites and the like. In October, we worked on plans for a survey to identify barriers that prevent people from accessing shelter uh, that uh, was first initiated back in January. Um, League has also provided much input to that. In our last meeting, uh, we reviewed uh, the inventory of shelter beds for this winter and the Chambers initiative. Um, we have just set up a special meeting. I don't think the invite has gone out yet, so this might be the first that some have heard about it because we um, typically we meet uh, on the, I think it's the last Thursday of the month, and of course that fell on Thanksgiving, so we combined our November and December meetings into a single meeting. Um, and we're going to have then a special meeting on the first Thursday of January, which is January 6th. So that's out of the normal rotation. Um, and then we'll have our regular meeting at the end of January. But at this uh, meeting on January 6th, we want to, um, uh, and this was at the uh, invitation of the Chamber and Brittany to have conversation. Uh, with them about that uh, initiative and particularly to get input from the stakeholders, uh, the agencies, and I know that uh, Brittany is looking for a way to connect with the various agencies to have two or three representatives uh, from the stakeholders who can uh, work with her in the chamber uh, in this process. So very much looking forward to that meeting and uh, that is open uh, to anyone who wishes to attend. So January 6th, at 2 p.m. I should say that Chris co-chairs this committee and uh, Chris, feel free if I've missed anything that you want to uh, chime in on. Yes, uh, we uh, just want to uh, thank everybody for making that committee uh, very uh, active and uh, contributing to the uh, future plans. I would like to say that uh, for public comments and uh, persons who are not providers or members of the stakeholder committee, Please feel free to come give us public comments uh, about what you hear or what you thought you think about the report on the uh, meeting on the 29th. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's uh, enjoy this single topic informational uh, meeting uh, and discussion with the chamber and our stakeholders. Um, so thank you very much for that, uh, Dan. And uh, next, I'd like to call uh, Ms. Sean Murphy for the membership committee. Hello. Um, we have not met in, uh, since we approved um, Mr. Fleck to join the uh, Poverty and Homelessness Board. However, at our last meeting, we did discuss that we will be meeting, um, scheduling a meeting soon after the first of the year to get it on the um, books to start talking about strategies of recruitment of new board members. Um, and particularly 
um, with supporting and how we can focus on recruiting uh, <clears throat> folks from the rural communities and other communities that are not necessarily well represented. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I really like that committee because it's how we uh, meet and address uh, some of the areas where uh, we need more representation or new representation for this body. And so uh, thank you for your hard work there. Um, next, Jim I'd like to ask. Jim yes, McAllister, if, if I may, just a very quick follow up on Tuesday. Yes, the Board of County Commissioners approved the recommendation of the Poverty and Homelessness Board, and Mike Fleck and Dr. Foster are officially members of the Poverty and Homelessness Board as of Tuesday. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, officially, thank you, uh, Councillor Fleck and Dr. Foster, for uh, joining our team. Um, <laughs> excellent. So, next, I would like to ask, uh, um, and this is a surprise call out, uh, Ms. Amanda Borda, would you please be willing to uh, share the current? Uh, work of the uh, HMIS eval committee. Amanda's off today, Chris. Oh, well then, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, I cannot see the screen. Um, uh, I have attended, but I have missed the, uh, two of the last three uh, committee meetings. I do know that uh, we have looked at separating RFPs from this committee. Um, but one of the functions that this body uh, the uh, HMIS, eval, and RFP committee has done is kind of fill the gaps for the official stuff that we're supposed to be working on. When we do the HMIS standards, this body was uh, looked at it, um, looked at some of the things that we recommended, and then uh, put it forward to, to the greater body of the Poverty and Homelessness Board uh, to uh, approve. They also help with uh, evaluating our continuum of care members, the uh, folks, our community agencies and partners who receive the federal dollars to help keep our shelters and services going. And so uh, we have a, a requirement to make sure that we check in with those who receive our services and make sure that we are up upholding and adhering to those expectations as well. And so uh, I will ask uh, for us to uh, present at the January meeting about what our plans are for this committee and uh, how people could possibly get more involved. With that, I would like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Foster to please uh, uh, share what's going on with the healthcare committee. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share. It was interesting that technically the health committee has probably not met for over a year, though several action groups under the health committee have been very active. In the last couple of months, we've kind of done a, a reset to that whole process. And we had a meeting last month that was well attended by 20 people, uh, a good cross representation um, and our next meeting is tomorrow. You know, I think that the goal that we have of the health committee is to kind of to the extent possible bring under one umbrella all the medical and mental health care that's being provided to these at risk populations. And I think there's kind of five big buckets we're, we're looking at. And one of those is coordination of care looking at what happens between hospital and clinics and those organizations that are working on the street, getting better communication is, is very important so people don't fall through the cracks. Another big area is, is mental health. I think we have somebody giving us an update on that at our meeting tomorrow. Another big issue is, is mobile care. It's interesting that even though we have the health committee, there are other groups and I'm not quite sure where they fit in, but there's a mobile care group that's meeting separately. And, and I'd like to try to coordinate everything together. Um, a third, a fourth area then is the navigation center and you know some recommendations about what kind of health care and mental health um, services could be offered there. And then the fifth big focus area is a medical respite. Just this last week, several of us took a field trip up to a uh, central city concern in portland and then to another uh location in salem and looked at what they are doing for medical respite and it was quite exciting and a small subgroup of us are meeting in january to try to figure out the next step of that but i really want to try to keep all of these separate groups that are working on stuff plugged into the health committee so that there's a, a big picture of everything 
And I'm excited about this health committee and, and where it's headed. And I'm, I'm glad to be the chair of it. Thank you very much, Dr. Foster. And uh, Dr. Kincaid uh, set the pace and uh, you are certainly uh, taking it and moving it forward. So uh, um, I appreciate uh, you joining our team. Next, I'd like to ask Susan Lopez to uh, speak to the youth committee. Yes, thank you. And I will invite Mr. Matias Smith to join me if I get anything wrong, please. Um, one of our fantastic PHB members and phenomenal uh, member for partnering with right now. So as you all are aware, we received a $3.6 million grant from the federal government to address youth homelessness, homelessness issues in Lane County. And we're very excited. We've been working actually very hard um, Matias is probably working harder than me because out of the three main groups that have been meeting regularly to get this up and running, I think Matias is part of all three of them. Um, I'm part of two of them. So the exciting thing about this grant is that it is youth led and it is youth designed and we're very excited right now. Let's see we're we have requested. Um, a planning grant, which would take a portion of the funds that we've been granted um, for us to be able to use um, for um, hiring FTE specifically, because this is a very large grant. There are a lot of moving pieces and the logistics of um, trying to manage this have been challenging for a volunteer um, committee board. So. Um, we're very excited that hopefully we'll get some county staff support to jump in on that full time. Um, also, the other piece that we're requesting funds for is um, to help with stipends for our youth representatives who are participating in all of these focus groups. Um, you know, we can't do this without them and we shouldn't do this without them. And it is only fair then that we compensate them fairly for their time and energy. So we're excited. Hopeful that that will get started. Um, I believe the planning grant was submitted already. I could be wrong. Um, I wish Amanda was here to correct me. Um, <clears throat> but then after that, things that are top of our list are working on um, kind of sorting out our governance, um, our processes as a group. Uh, we have two basically, um, Youth Action Councils, and they are going to be meeting separately and then together to propose processes for our smaller kind of core group. And then those will be presented to our Youth Homelessness Solutions work group. And then all of those would then be funneled up, obviously. So there are a lot of moving parts to this, and we're really excited. We've been working really hard um, trying to come up with some of those governance and the structures and the subcommittees that we're going to need moving forward. And Matias, did I miss anything? Uh, no, I think you got it all. All right. Lots of hard work ahead of us, and we're so excited to do it. So we're very fortunate. And thank you all for your support. This is our this was our third time. So third time's a charm. We're very excited that we got awarded. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Matias. And uh, uh, thanks to... Uh, Alex Dreer and Amanda Porta for staffing this effort and uh, help bringing these dollars to Lane County for our youth. As a former homeless youth, I, uh, I'm uh, very stoked about this effort. Um, I'd just like to, before we move on to the very next topic, uh, give a plug for a new committee that has been approved by the uh, Poverty and Homelessness Board to start. It's our coordinated entry committee. Lots of our members have expressed a need and an interest in this work happening in our county. And we need to be able to populate a committee of our members um, to be able to help move this forward. So please reach out to myself or James Yule after this meeting if you're interested in learning more about what coordinated entry is in this county, as well as what's needed from this committee. Um, thank you very much for that. And uh, I'd like to uh, move out of committee reports uh, and thank everybody for their grace. It's been a while since we've had such a robust uh, committee report set a layout. So thank you for everybody who participated in that. Um, next item is, one second, jurisdictions report. Is there anything from the city of Springfield or the city of Eugene uh, that we'd like to share real quick? 
I definitely have some things I'd like to share for the city of Eugene, if I may, Chair. Yes, Madam. Uh, so yes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I um, I have a sort of two updates and a and a and a note of appreciation to extend. And I would say the the first update is um, that our safe sleeping site at 310 Garfield opened and I have had a tour of it and it's really, it's so beautifully laid out. It's uh, so well managed. Kudos to St. Vincent de Paul for all of the work they have done to um, you know, establish a really welcoming place. And there are already some success stories there where there were three people who moved in who have already accessed permanent housing. There was a person who was able to get a long awaited surgery because they were stable enough uh, in their living situation to have that surgery. Now, there was a woman who had been uh, first time homeless, lost her job, moved into the safe sleeping site and then was able to actually get a new job and is in the process of looking for housing. So already just you know, within a month, that space is proving to be um, useful. And, and that leads me into both a, 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 another update from the city and a, and a thank you to the, to the county. The, the city council approved our um, supplemental budget in December. This is a mid-year budget approval process for things that we didn't know or couldn't account for in the initial budget approval in the, in the spring. And it includes a, a commitment by the city on how we would use our American Rescue Plan funds. And so the city has approved a total of homeless services of, we have 37, we have $17 million to work with in the first year, 37 million over two years of that ARPA cycle. And to put uh, 13 million of it towards homeless services. And that includes 2.4 million towards just sort of improved coordination and outreach and support for our uh, people who are camping within the city, 5.3 million to help us with the safe sleeping sites and um, another million of do dollars to put towards the, uh, the shared investment with the county on the shelter and navigation sites. So big steps forward with those uh, kind of one-time two-year funds, but it's helping us move forward on a crisis. And, then my thank you to the county because the county has also approved the use of ARPA funds to support those very parallel investments in outreach and the shelter services and supporting providers. And so really we are working more closely than ever before moving that and taking advantage of these um, both federal and the city has and state funds, ARPA funds that uh, we can use to really uh, address the suffering on our streets and our need to improve services. So thank you to all of you. Chris, I've got a couple of things. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mayor Van Gordon. So um, I do have, uh, I do want to share some of the, uh, the outcomes of our ARPA discussions. We are not gifted with $37 million. If, if Lucy wants to trade our ARPA numbers, I'll be more than happy to. Um, but the, the city of Springfield is going to allocate about $13 million. Um, we've had the first discussion. Uh, some, some, we've uh, granted at least a million to Willamette Lane, and one of that was specifically to fill in a gap in our in, in Springfield services, which was around child care and how do we start up after school programs again so that people can actually make it to their job on time and have the availability to work. So I thought that was a pretty uh, important, important step. Um, the home consortium, which, it, which Mayor Vinnis and I are, are a part of, did have their RFP, uh, first RFP uh, meetings yesterday. Um, so we're in the middle of starting the process to allocate you know, the regions about a million dollars-ish of uh, federal dollars that go to building and developing affordable housing. So we'll get an opportunity to, to see and hear about those, uh, those uh, projects in the next probably six months or so. Um, but they usually are targeted at at-risk populations that, you know, like I think one of them was the Dev Northwest about foster kids again, which is really, I thought was really, really important. And then the, you know, the city council met, we reallocated some of our CDBG funds. Um, we had leftover CARES funds. Some of that went to uh, providing additional support to carry it forward for dealing with our RVs uh, that break down in the streets and trying to get them back on track. 
as well as um, adding more money for uh, hotel vouchers uh, based on increment weather. So just a couple of things going on. And I think this is the most, this is kind of an important opportunity. I saw the first dates um, for the annual trip going back, uh, going back to DC where the elected officials um, get to lobby. Um, it is always important to sh keep sharing stories because those stories, when they touch a county commissioner or the mayors, I'm um, turning to stories we tell our federal delegation as well. That's what I had, Chris. Thank you very much, sir. Exciting work in both Eugene and Springfield. And as we uh, uh, continue to uh, work on things, uh, we'll share with the, the community. Um, next, we have, in order, in the sake of time, uh, I have uh, Kate Budd about the uh, 2021 year in review and a uh, short item after that by Pat Farr that's related to ARPA. Thank you, Chris. And I'm actually going to pass this to Stephanie Talbot, uh, Windland County, who's gonna share more about the amazing uh, rental assistance work that's happening as well as the uh, notable energy assistance work. Thank you, Kate. And um, I am going to ask Diana to um, allow me to share my screen, please. You should be able to do so right now. Um, there we go. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Get the right thing open. All right. So um, there we go. All right. Thank you guys very much for having me here at the Poverty and Homelessness Board. Um, we've talked a lot about rent relief this year, but there is a lot of funding that has been going through this program and um, it has helped thousands of Lane County residents and um, we continue to have funding um, and we're going to just kind of do a little peek back at where we've been through 2021 and then talk about what we see on the horizon for 2022. Um, as some of you know, we really um, have only been doing rent relief at this volume since um, about 18 months, since the middle of 2020. So it is all, um, you know, pretty new stuff, um, especially for something this large. Um, and I see Cheryl's hand up. Um, should we wait till the end to take comment or do you have something quick? Well, I don't know if it's quick, but it pertained to what uh, Mayor Bennis and Mayor Gordon were speaking oh, to. Oh, okay. Well, um, I am happy to um, have that follow up now if you want to before I get going. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a tough question, but I do want to raise it because sometimes we do gloss over it. With the funds that are available, can can someone um, indicate how much of those might be going to support um, substance use disorder, support addiction recovery programs? I can address that from the county perspective if uh, the mayors want to address that first. I think that's yours, Commissioner. Thank you, and uh, Cheryl, that's a that's a great question. I'll I'll talk about the county. We we got seventy four million dollars to allocate in two what is commonly be called being called tranches, and we allocated the first that the first highest level of immediate funding on Tuesday. Included in our list is, uh, for instance, behavioral health criminal justice diversion, much of which has to do with um, uh, substance use and and how do we uh, address substance use. Um, there are others that, are, that I'll talk about when in, in the item that uh, Chris has uh, said I would add later. But there are a number of uh, issues that uh, one is the um, we are putting $7 million into the uh, what has been commonly called the Behavioral Health Crisis Center, the Adult Crisis Center. That's a start. That's only a beginning of the funding for what ultimately is going to address a lot of the needs that you're talking about with Cheryl, which is a, a diversion from jail and into services for people who are suffering the greatest from uh, behavioral health disorders to include substance. That's just a very 
brief brush on it, uh, Chair McAllister, and, and Cheryl, you and I can talk more in detail about what precisely that means. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. In, uh, Lucy, do you want to go first? Mayor Venice? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on that, that in the minutes that we approved for our, for our last meeting, I had made a request about getting a presentation before this body about sort of Lane County Behavioral Health and sort of their strategic plan around mental health investments and, and meeting the need. And so I just want to reiterate that now that I would love to see that on a future agenda. So these pieces that the commissioners just described, but what is the larger picture and are there ways in which we can inform or influence that? Is there an opportunity for the providers to talk about what their needs are? So I would just love to get uh, more of a framework on Lane County Behavioral Health, where it's going and what its plans are and you know where it needs our, our sort of input and support. And I Mayor Venice, that's a Great uh, uh, statement, and just so you know, your request has been heard, and we're looking at that in the January um, agenda, possibly January, February. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had enough people involved to make that discussion really fruitful. So uh, I, I just want you to know we hear you and we uh, we support that effort. And Chris, I'll give the the, the ten second the spiel so we can get back on track. Um, in, in Springfield, this isn't related to ARPA funds, but we do have a working group right now in our municipal court system that's specific to, to stand up a drug court for the first time. Um, we've talked about doing that for a couple of years. Um, you know, we've got great models, you know, to, to work for, and we're doing a lot of the initial work right now to get that, get that going. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Are there any other comments or uh, uh, concerns on this topic? Hearing none, seeing no hands. Um, are there any uh, other items to carry on on this? Or, or is this just a report? Um, is it okay if I continue with the rent presentation? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. And um, so I, I just wanted to offer a quick recap of the different funds we're doing within 2021. Um, prior funds included <clears throat> CARES funding and the like, but in 2021, we had STAR, which is was um, state funding um, by the legislature, um, ERA funding from the Consolidated Appropriations Act, ERA two from the American Recovery Act. And um, then we also, those two were direct allocations to Lane County. We also received a portion of the state's ERA one allocation. Um, those, you know, STAR ended in June. Um, the other funds we still have um, to spend and are scheduled to send down in 2022. We have till 2023 to spend the ERA two, but we imagine it will be spent out far before that. Um, so here's the amount of funds received. And um, a lot of times when we talk about rent relief, we're really talking about these direct service dollars right down the middle. Um, of of course, we do get a portion of funding to be able to support staff to distribute these funds and, um, you know, things that they need, computers and workspaces and the like. But really, it's the gray column. When people ask us, you know, how much rent relief you have, that is what goes out to landlords. Um, another really quick thing is we can move money from admin and delivery into direct services. And generally, um, we do not bill out all the admin and delivery. And so these numbers are a little bit fluid in that I can say we have 14 9 million in Aware right now. And, you know, I could give you a report in three months that could say we have 15.1 million. And it's generally because we've moved some funds from admin and delivery into rent. So um, again, looking at the direct services, these are the same numbers from the previous slide. As of yesterday, when I ran some, or two days ago, when I ran data, um, we had expended um, $27.9 million in 2021. 
Um, you can see that we have spent out the star that was ended in June. Um, we are really close on our first allocation of ERA, which we call ERLC, and really close on our state allocation of the treasury funding also. Um, we have just started to pivot to um, the LCERA, which is the second batch of Department of Treasury money. Um, and we are, um, we work with um, all sorts of nonprofit partners throughout the community. And so as they are spending out the ERLC, we're getting them going on the LCERA. But we have helped 4,643 Lane County households. Um, that's really exciting. These are unduplicated households. So it is possible that somebody received help from STAR and from one of these other funds, but these are unduplicated households. And um, you know that is a, a large percentage of um, people that we have been able to touch with these programs. Um, so that's kind of where we sit right now, but you know, we have a whole new um, year coming and what does that look like? Um, so we are expecting that we will spend out both um, our, so the Department of Treasury, the ERA one money, we have our direct allocation, ERLC and the state allocation OERA will be spent out early in 2022, um, probably January, maybe February, but probably sooner than that. Um, and then we anticipate that this other fund that we're just starting to tap into will be spent out by the end of the fiscal year, but really we're probably talking about um, April or May. Some of it is dependent on a few other factors. Like we did request 10 million more from the treasury. Um, depending on where that might come from and what their spending deadline is on that, we may need to spend this earlier than um, the LCERA. Um, Senate Bill um, 5561 dedicated additional funding to rent relief. That was just um, approved on Monday. So this is um, brand new information and we don't have a lot of detail about the exact amount of funding that we will be receiving. But we did directly request over five and a half million dollars. And that's just to get us through the amount of people that um, have currently applied. So the remainder of our funding that we have at hand, we would still need an additional 5.5 million to serve people that have already applied to the program. We do expect an additional allocation by formula for ongoing eviction protection from that money. Um, it has been um, earmarked as eviction protection. We have not gotten a lot of um, guidance on exactly what that term means. Um, we do believe it will be some portion of rent relief though. Um, Lane County's application for rent relief is currently closed, as well as the state AWARA application. Um, we have around 3,000 applications right now that we are being processing with our nonprofit partners. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I'm constantly um, clarifying is that this is not a first come first serve program. Department of Treasury laid out certain prioritization and um, those have to do with serving people who have um, the fewest resources and the greatest need first. Um, we continue to work with the Springfield Eugene Tenant Association and um, the Oregon Law Center to address people with evictions. They are um, yeah, being prioritized in these programs. Um, we have more applications than we currently have funding for in hand. So again, we are anticipating, you know, money from the state from the um, recent Senate bill. We have asked the treasury for 10 million additional dollars. And so we um, are confident that we will be able to serve everybody who has applied to date. Um, the state has also indicated that they will reopen 
their application for rent assistance. They have not given a timeline for that, but um, where they sit is they also have a second allocation of the ERA treasury funding that they really haven't tapped into. Um, and then also as far as what's next for tenants is um, at the same time, um, the legislature passed Senate Bill 891 and that gave tenants additional protections from eviction. Um, so essentially through um, September 30th, 2022, if somebody has applied for rent assistance, they will be um, protected from eviction while that application is being processed. Um, so there are protections out there. Um, there is also, and I just met with the folks this morning, what's called the Landlord Guarantee Fund. So if um, a landlord has a tenant who um, gets denied for rent relief, they can get reimbursed for that funding for the period of time that that um, application was pending. So, um, you know, there are recourses that um, for both tenants and landlords. So that's a little snapshot of um, where we were for the prior year and what we see on the horizon. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions and I do see um, that Brittany Quick Warner does have her hand up. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I had a couple that I think you answered there. So I'll, I'll circle back myself to get the answer if it wasn't there, but I'm curious. So the numbers that you just gave, those were only, that's the money going directly into the county, I'm assuming, but I thought I heard both Mayor Van Gordon and Mayor Venice talk about rent relief that they've done at the city level as well. That doesn't include those. And are those all coordinated? Oh, sorry. Um, I had to um, unmute again. Um, no, um, I am sorry. They, they did fund rent relief, and I do believe it was in 2021. Um, through their CDBG funds. And I am so laser focused on this ERA funding right now um, that I do apologize. And you wanna know, I can, um, during the rest of the meeting, I can put the numbers in the chat of those other funds. Yeah, and I guess the question, so are people going through Lane County to get rent relief throughout the entire county or this, do the two cities have their processes that are separate? So for um, the city of Eugene gave us the affordable housing trust fund funding for rent relief. Um, the city of Springfield gave us CDBG CV. Um, and so both of those went through the county and the advantage of doing it that way. And I'm sure Lisa can give you more insight on that is we can look, um, run it through the HMIS database and ensure that there's no duplication of effort on those fronts. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we are working with our nonprofit partners generally to do the processing of those applications. So um, somebody would present Catholic Community Services or St. Vincent de Paul or, you know, Homes for Good and ask for that type of assistance, um, you know, and that's where they would actually get served. Okay, perfect. That's what I was hoping for. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent, Stephanie. Do you have anything else you'd like to share? Or if there's anybody who needs more information about this program, how can they reach you? Um, my email address is up on the screen. I can also put it in the chat, but I do see another hand from Brooke Freed. Yes, uh, Brooke. Hi there. I was just going to add that the city of Eugene, Eugene did contribute CDBG funding um, toward rent relief. The way that it was used was um, to support those agencies that were administering the funding. Um, so um, that was how we chose to support that effort in addition to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So you were right, Brittany, there was some CDBG from the city, but those weren't direct rent allocations. It was really to support the capacity to get those funds out. Again, my apologies for not holding that in here. 
Well, um, thanks again, Stephanie. Um, we look forward to hearing how this uh, continues on. So uh, maybe uh, in the next month or so, you can uh, uh, give us some more information. Uh, excellent. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Um, Kate, uh, did you have anything else you'd like to add uh, before we move on to Lisa and Dana? I'm glad to table the next topic in the um, kind of vein of, of knowing we have little time left. So, excellent. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we will be uh, following up with some strategic plan uh, updates uh, next month uh, per uh, this uh, item. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, Lisa Stewart and Dana uh, Davison to uh, talk about our data. This is approximately 15 minutes. There's my unmute button. Got it. I'm going to leave my camera off because I'm sharing my screen. Um, hopefully, can you all see it? Yes. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> all right. So we are going to, Dana um, Davison and I are the senior management analysts working on the visualizations for the human services division. And we've added a few more. We want to keep you updated in this ties in really nicely to Stephanie's presentation. In the chat, I have added the link to the public site. Um, hopefully you all have been here. It would be super helpful when you log in and you do find a visualization you like, go ahead and make it a favorite so we know that um, if it's working for you. And just a reminder, if it is not working for you, let us know because we would love to have a chance to um, improve on these dashboards. So when you open your browser, you will see all of the visualizations that we currently have been approved to publicly post. And starting here at the far left is our homeless housing and shelter inventory, which most of you have seen before. And this is the report that shows the average utilization of housing and sheltered inventory that's dedicated to persons experiencing homelessness. I'm not gonna open this one, because we've seen it before and I know we're super short on time. So let's do pop over to this new um, newer report. This is the shelter utilization um, specifically just for shelters and it's a companion dashboard to the previous homeless housing and shelter inventory. And this report shows the average utilization of all the shelters in Lane County that enter data into HMIS. There is a description of what those shelters are and how we speak about alternative shelters and emergency shelter, both doing the work of sheltering vulnerable people in our community. I'll just click there. This report is updated monthly, by the way. Um, just to note that there are likely some alternative shelters that do not use HMIS in our community. And this is a reminder to folks that HMIS will be made available to shelter providers upon request. We will help um, those providers uh, use our system and we'll pay for it and the training and help them get up to speed. So what this report does is it is designed to show daily utilization for the month selected. So like that inventory visualization, the previous one, the older one, this report breaks out projects into the two types, alternative and emergency, but it also breaks them down a little further into drop-in, which are sites that um, if that person has the need that day and there's availability, they could, if there's availability, actually be sheltered that night. And then there's programmatic, and programmatic shelter is um, more for folks who uh, have to go through a screening, they have to sign an agreement, there may be some restrictions or um, that it's focused on a particular population. So that's how we split that out. And again, if you go back to the report information, you can read what those, how we've split that. So when we're looking at these, uh, all the sites, and you can see there are a lot of sites in Lane County right now that are providing shelter, still not enough, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. But when you look at one of these, um, what we see here, let's just look at Dust to Dawn, which was recently reclassified as emergency shelter and is no longer alternative. And I think that's a major win for Lane County um, because we know what it is. And so, yay, thank you, HUD. 
So when we look at uh, dust to dawn, you can see that what this report is telling us is that on average, every night, 100 guests are staying at dust to dawn. But I know by looking at the other report, the bed inventory report, that there's actually 105 beds. So the question is, why are we not showing 105 a night? Well, like all shelters, people check in, but then they may leave before lights are out or some beds are reserved. But life events for that individual may intervene, such as a wellness concern, other opportunities for shelter that night, or maybe um, worst case scenario, they were incarcerated for the night. Uh, this uh, St. Vincent Paul project is a really good one to look at for this because they are so on top of their data entry. It's a good example of what to expect for shelter. But I'm kind of curious, so it's 100 a night. If I click on this, I can see the utilization for every night in the month. I can also, if I wanted to look back, I can look at any month going back and see that daily utilization by looking on here. And if I'm done looking at that particular project, I click on it again. I can go look at another project, the safe sleep, sleep site. Whoa, already full. There, there's that utilization for that project. So it's, this is a current through November 30th now, and um, we will update it. We update it. Um, uh, Dana knows best on this, like within the first week of the month. We like yeah, to give some, the sometime oh, between the fifth and the tenth. Usually, we like to try and do it as close to the fifth of the month as possible. Thank you. So, when I navigate around on this site, I can go back up to the top and click back on Human Services Division to look at all the visualizations available. So, the next one is the rent assistance. Now, this is a this is totally what uh, Stephanie was just sharing with you. But the rent assistance is, uh, is activities that are managed by in HMIS. Dana and I will be adding the Oregon Emergency Rental Assistance Program as a separate sheet in this dashboard um, early January. So you will be able to see the full scope. But what we're looking at here are the projects that we run out of our division in our system. So what we have are uh, two tabs. One is just the amount that was allocated to each of the um, agencies distributing the funds out to the community. And then the blue bar is the amount that was actually distributed from that allocation. And this is for all the funds. This includes the Affordable Housing Trust, CARES, CDBG, um, Springfield, which did fund the direct payments, whereas Eugene funded the support for the people making the payments, and all the different um, funds that we've had since the COVID rent assistance has started. So you can actually sort by these funds. So you can look at a specific fund, or you can just look at it to understand the scope of folks who have been served. So... <clears throat> So here we have that broken out for you and you can see where everybody is that they've spent their monies through. And when the allocations change, if more monies were to come into the system, those um, that uh, allocated bar would extend and it's up to date um, each month. The other tab are the client demographics and the demographics show who received those dollars and breaking out by looking at different demographics. So on the left side, these are the, are on the top here, this is the total households receiving funding and the total clients, which are the total number of household members. And you can look at uh, where the person um, lives or the household lives, what the um, race um, demographics are, ethnicity, whether they're a veteran household, age groups, gender, and the medium um, family income for these households, which the majority uh, are in below zero to 30% medium family income, which is it's very low poverty, extreme poverty. If you hover over any of these bars, you can get the full scope of the data that are behind there, just so you know. Moving back up here. 
Um, the next one is the one you're probably the most familiar with, at least I hope so. And that is the homelessness in Lane County. And I'm not gonna open that because we've looked at that multiple times. Uh, most of you are familiar with this database. Um, it is generated by the homeless by name list that we collect um, through our homeless management information system. This continues to be the most complete data set we have available to understand populations of people experiencing homelessness and looking at the trends in our county. Finally, um, at, at your request, we have added those acronyms. So we pop the acronyms in here and uh, I'm surprised this is, you only have to scroll about a yard down here to see all of the acronyms. Um, these are, um, just the different funds that we have, project types, the different terms that we toss around uh, with abandon. Here they all are on your list. The other tab, when you click over here, is the acronyms for the service providers, which we use in all those reports. And rather than trying to disguise them, we thought we would showcase them because these folks do amazing work and they should get full recognition. So. That is what I have. Dana, did I miss anything? Nope, I think you're good. All right. So, uh, folks, um, questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I had a quick question, and then I have three hands up, I see. Um, I noticed that one of on the rent assistance uh, tab, there was a, a number that was over 100%. Uh, do we compensate folks who are still allocating but uh, are going above and beyond? I'll let Stephanie answer that question. Hi there. Yes, it is possible for people to be over 100%. And again, we go back to, we can move funds between some categories sometimes. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly which fund that was, that went over for them without looking at it. But um, we can move between agencies. We can move um, between, like, as I said, that admin and delivery fund and program money. So it is occasional that somebody would go over um, 100%. We, we definitely don't encourage it. It does take a little jockeying to cover those situations. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you very much. So Cheryl Balsarup, uh, Brittany Cook Warner, and then uh, Commissioner. Uh, uh, trigger. Great, thank you. Um, we all know the power of information and this data is so critical. I was going to touch on um, one of the issues that uh, the Chamber brings up in their report is how critical it is that we rebuild community trust and their confidence and in, I think information and in the work that's being done. And I think it's been a couple weeks now, but it was reported in media that through uh, local efforts that the um, mothers and children or parties with children have been brought to functional zero. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact language. And I cannot recall how many phone calls I got on this that it's not accurate to say that there aren't any more families <laughs> that aren't experiencing homelessness. And obviously there's some technical language, but I'm wondering if you all are getting that question, how that shows up in the data, and how we might be more accurate in communicating with the public, because while we're wanting to um, communicate progress, that communicating things like that that are misconstrued can actually lose a lot of credibility in the public. I'm glad you brought that up. And if James is on the call, it would be great if he could respond to that. Um, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so to answer the first part of the question, yes, definitely. Got, I also got a barrage of emails and calls, and I completely understand um, the concern for that. The media report was completely misconstruing what was said. Um, we were talking specifically about family households on the centralized wait list. Um, 100% recognize that that is a small snapshot of the larger uh homeless family population in our county. Um, we were highlighting built for zero efforts um, that we utilized via coordinated entry to start moving chronic families into housing more quickly. Um, 
and it was taken out of context by the media. Um, and that was, we were by no means saying that we had uh, ended family homelessness in our county. Um, we were just highlighting a coordinated entry improvement piece that we were excited about and want to uh, expand to larger populations. But I definitely understand why um, folks were concerned by the message that was given by the media. Thank you very much for that, James and Lisa, for um, working that out. Um, next up is Brittany, followed by Commissioner Traeger. Traeger. My, questions, my questions were specific, but I'm actually going to respond to Cheryl's comment because I uh, completely agree and actually was just on the phone with a um, woman out of Bakersfield, California this morning who runs their... Uh, um, is a point person for their work with Built for Zero and just talking to them about the experience they've had and and kind of how it's worked for their community because they were able to reach functional zero for chronic homelessness and got a lot of really good feedback from her on the communication piece of things because they we are not alone in experiencing that backlash from the community and they learned a lot in the way that they communicated how how they were making progress so happy to share that with folks when it's appropriate um to Cheryl's point, though, I feel like the communication is a huge way we build back trust. And great job, Lisa, for getting this information and the team that did this, because this is a, a start to getting us to a place where we can communicate that better. Um, but I think that media miscommunicating is a good example of how if we work together in more of a collective impact model, the media is at the table learning about this stuff so they can communicate better when, they, when it's time for them to put the messages out there. So all of that to say, I would love to help with those pieces. My very specific technical question was on the rent. Um, your total numbers that you have there, the 26 million, is that excluding the administrative pieces or does that include the administrative? Uh... That is only the direct payment dollars that has no admin or program um, administration dollars. Perfect, thank That's what I was wondering. Thank you, Brittany. Um, Commissioner? Thank you, Chris. Just a quick question about the race and ethnicity data. Is that, um, does the provider enter that based on their best guess observable? Does the client self declare? And then also if someone identifies as um, multiple mixed race, does that show up in other? Do they check more than one box? Can you just share a little bit about how that's captured? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is, um, the, this is self-reported from the client. It is not an observation and they can check more than one box. So this is, uh, this first race is what everybody said. And down here, whether it is, it, we break it out a little differently to say whether the uh, individual is white, non-Hispanic, or is of the BIPOC community. So we can break it out different ways because we collect it more granularly. So if that is something that you want to see differently, that would be a good uh, request to make if there's a different way of looking at these information. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Excellent. So um, I thank you, Lisa, for this. Uh, knowing that we are uh, um, a couple, uh, like a minute away from our technical close, and knowing that we had one comment uh, earlier mentioned, I'd like to ask for a momentary extension so that we can receive the one uh, public comment. Can I get head nods? Excellent. Um, uh, with that in mind, thank you, Lisa and Dana, for your hard work. Uh, Richard Self, please uh, make yourself available. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to really be quick here and say that in uh, reference to the report Julie gave earlier from League in on, on the system mapping, I wanted to note that this is the system mapping and float and flow chart is intertwined with changing actually how the system works and our uh, coordinated entry system and such so that an actual intake will take place at a physical point A that can be reached by phone online or physically there for all. But um, th this is just part of the idea of changing exactly how we serve those we're trying to help and that they get the help that they need from the get-go. And uh, that's why I'd be honored to serve on Mr. Elwell's uh, co uh, Coordinated Entry Committee uh, when that starts. And I appreciate your, this time. 
Excellent. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, everybody, for, oh, yes, um, uh, Pat Farr uh, has a, a, a last minute announcement, and then we'll move to adjourn. Um, I'll make it very quick. Uh, regarding ARPA money, uh, the county does have a great deal of it. It seems like more than the cities we do, $74 million. Much of that is being spent in cooperation with the same systems and projects that the cities are working on. The county and the cities are integral in spending the money and making sure that we're doing it on a concerted basis. That's all. I'm not going to go into detail regarding that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everybody, for making this a very solid meeting. We had a lot of reports and we have a lot of action. We've, we're doing so much with each individual partner and we're doing a lot even more collectively. So here is for a great 2021 wrap up, but know that we have a lot of work for 2022 and I'm excited to work with all of you. Have a great day and meeting adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.